Morning, good morning. Oh, that's funny. I can't see a thing through the windscreen, but you can. There we are. That's better. That tree in there is a walnut tree. Blew over in a storm about three years ago. So we decided to cut it down and leave it out there for the kids to play on. Slow way or fast way? Slow way or fast way? Fast way. Still very warm for the uh, for the date, 19th of October. <coughs> the car's still as rattly and squeaky as it always has been. <coughs> Excuse me. They're um, putting uh, poles in and stringing wires up and planting apple trees over there and they burn off all the grass underneath the uh, the rows of trees with glyphosate and uh, which you know a lot of uh, wokeness about glyphosate especially in America I think they banned it but over here it gets uh, thousands of gallons get sprayed about willy-nilly so <clears throat> how are you hope you're still well I'm uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, running around like headless chickens going on at the top of government. It doesn't bode well. I said to Mrs. Angry, this is like the fall of Rome, you know, the, uh, when the Roman Empire was collapsing, it was characterized by corruption, high taxes, uncertainty, you know, the only thing that didn't change was gravity. If you drop something, it still fell down. But, you know, companies that shouldn't exist existed. People that shouldn't be in jobs were in jobs. Things that shouldn't have happened, happened. It's just literally anarchy with with the government in place, you know. So, the thing is not whether the government's going to survive or whether certain politicians are going to survive. That's only of interest to them and their family. The question is whether you're going to survive. Thank you, Mr. Openreach. Very polite and noted. Not that I'd ever use Openreach, mind you. I, no Openreach is the uh, wholesale provider, isn't it? Yeah. Fiber. Don't know what they're doing around here. I don't think they, they even know fiber has been invented in this part of the country. Yeah, so, uh, you know, whatever silly buggery is going on today, you can all you can guarantee is that twice as amount of silly buggery is going to be going on tomorrow. The um, biggest problem the government got is, is the debt interest, which is the interest they pay on the money they've already created and pissed up the wall to spend on various projects, you know, since 1971 but mainly since 2008. They cannot afford for the interest rate to go up. They just literally couldn't pay the interest. So they've got to keep the interest rate down. And the Japanese have uh, found a way of doing this. And what they do is that their central bank buys government bonds, which are just government IOUs. And by keeping the price of government IOUs up, it keeps the interest on, which is fixed, on government IOUs down. And so uh, as a result, uh, all that happens is that the uh, market gets flooded with yen, which are created by the central bank to um, redeem all these government IOUs. So, watch Mike Maloney's Hidden Secrets of Money if you don't understand any of this. So what's, what's happening is that you've got the, um, it's almost like everyone was in cry, cry sleep and they've suddenly woken up because it's not like you couldn't have seen this coming. Everybody who was watching this saw this coming except the people who were actually got their hands on the levers of power. And they knew people said to trust it was a poison chalice to take the uh, prime ministership which it was, but not, you know, for circumstances which are entirely beyond her control. Uh, Rishi Sunak, having helped create the carnage, I think probably was like, felt glad, uh, like Boris, he's probably on the beach somewhere with Boris 
saying, thank God uh, we dodged that bullet, you know. But the problem is that the Bank of England, uh, for years and years and years, has monetized government debt by basically cashing these government IOUs and saying, yeah, okay, you went five billion pound IOU, yeah, no problem, you have five billion pound cash. 10 billion, yeah, have 10 billion pound cash. We'll stick the IOU in the till and we'll give you the cash and then, you know, when the time comes, we'll, um, you know, you can pay us back. Well, of course, the government never pays you back. Never pays you back. Keynes said that the government should create money when it needs to and it should pay you back. But they, Keynesians, they like the money printing bit, but they don't like the paying you back bit. So they never pay you back. So the Bank of England has finally like, you know, well, um, we're actually going to sell some of your IOUs on the open market. It's British government debt. You know, everyone knows you're good for it, even if you have to print the money. So it's not like, you know, you're, we're not going to get... Uh... Oh, that was a bit cheeky. Mr. New Pizza in town. It should say New Pillock in town on the side of that bus. Anyway, so the Bank of England now is selling government IOUs at the same time as the government is going to continue to sell their own IOUs. Although I don't know who they're going to sell them to because they could, people weren't really interested in buying them on the world market. Who wants sterling, you know, for delivery in about five years' time that's paying a 3% or 4% interest? When inflation is 10%, the value of sterling is going down 10% a year, and you're being asked to accept 4% a year. <coughs> now, I mean, there are reasons why people buy treasuries, even though they know that they're going to make a loss on them. But let's not, that's beyond the scope of this dental podcast, right? <laughs> so. So what's happening is the Bank of England now is going to be competing with the government to sell government treasuries, government IOUs. And what's that going to do to the price of IOUs? It's going to send them down, isn't it? They're going to be more on the market, fewer buyers, and so the price of them is going to go down. So the interest rate payable on government debt, which is a fixed percentage, is going to go up as a percentage of the price. And that's why interest rates go up the price of bonds go down, particularly the ones that mature after five years. Anyway, how do I know all this? How do I know all this? So I've, I've, it's an interest of mine. It's just a hobby of mine. I listen to a lot of podcasts. The great thing about podcasts is you can, you can pretend you're a professor of economics at London School and listen to the same stuff they listen to, you know? And it's not like, literally, it's not beyond the wit of the average dentist to understand. Once you've really, you know, you've done economics, well, economics 101. So, what you've got is, so, so you've got the government saying, we're going to go for growth. And to go for growth, what we've got to do is we've got to reduce taxes and we've got to, um, and also because of uh, the uh, supply side shock, we're going to increase uh, support you know like for electricity bills and things like that and so which is a bit like someone who's already way way in over their head with their credit um, saying uh, well what I'm gonna do is I'm going to you know I can't afford to pay all this credit back and I can't tell the creditors that they're not gonna get it uh, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna become a millionaire and then uh, when I'm a multi-millionaire then the, uh, the amount that I owe is going to be peanuts. And so my credit is just going to shut up. Because, like, you know, it'll be a tiny, you know, they'll be happy to lend it to me because they know I'm a multi multi millionaire. So, what, in the meantime, what I'm going to do, I'm just going <laughs> to, I'm just going to go out shopping and buy a load more clothes while I'm thinking about becoming a multi multi millionaire. <coughs> exactly at the same time as the credit card companies sitting there thinking to yourself, actually, I'm, we are a bit overexposed to this particular wannabe multi-multi-millionaire, and we think we're going to start calling in a bit of the debt. So, honestly, you know, and then and then they wonder why it's, it's entirely predictable, entirely predictable. People have been telling them for years. 
but I don't know what's happened to the Bank of England. But you know, for years the Bank of England has sat there, fat, dumb and happy, monetizing government debt, accepting bonds, IOUs, and giving them the cash. And then and everyone's saying, you shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> you know, you're not, the purpose of the central bank, the bank is not to monetize government debt. If you cash every check they write, they're gonna, governments go bananas with the spending. You know, they want to spend on, they like deficit budgets, they like fighting expensive foreign wars. You know, they like uh, sleeping with their campaign managers and their research assistants and spending tons of money on getting re-elected. It's a nice lifestyle. So, <laughs> so uh, the Bank of England has some, somehow has had a blow to the head. Someone, they must have just, I don't know, perhaps they were just cashing an IOU and they opened a cupboard and a bloody great sack of money fell on the head of the director of the Bank of England. And he's like, he's woken up and he's like, oh yeah, actually the House of Lords did say we shouldn't be doing this. Perhaps we shouldn't be doing it. Uh, or perhaps, I don't know, perhaps he's made a friend somewhere, you know, at the Federal Reserve who said, you shouldn't be doing this. And so, well, more likely the Bank of Switzerland, the, the Swiss Central Bank probably had a word with him, or the German Central Bank, because they're not really, uh, they're doing it a bit, but, and the Americans are doing it a lot, and the Japanese are just beyond a joke, you know, the Japanese are a uh, uh, hopeless, hopeless case. The Japanese is the yardstick for, uh, I mean, leaving aside countries like Venezuela, uh, and, uh, I don't know, uh, you know, all these uh, so uh, socialist republics, that uh, Tim Potter dictatorships that uh, print money into oblivion regularly every 15 years. But the Japanese is the only sort of country that's managed to do it without uh, without having to re-denominate the currency so that there's like a million new yen to one old yen, which is what, the way they always do it when they get hyperinflation. The Japanese have had a big bout of inflation not hyperinflation, they've still got the yen, but they've got a big bout of inflation. And then we have, because we've been printing money, like spending it like a drunken sailor, we are now having a big bout of inflation. Inflation's 10%. And, uh, but the, um, the Swiss, um, literally, their money started going up so much because they weren't printing it that um, they would come under a lot of pressure to print some. They were actually told that they better get their bloody printing presses warmed up and uh, drop a WD-40 on them or they're gonna be in big trouble because they don't, people don't wanna fly into uh, the Swiss franc as uh, you know, to preserve their wealth. Now the other uh, commodity, currency, call it what you like, call it a currency. It's not, it's a money, it's a not, yeah, a currency, but it's a money. The other type of money that is, is extremely hard and scarce and useful is Bitcoin. But people, a lot of people can't get their head around Bitcoin yet. You know, they're like, oh, I don't know, it's, you know, uh, isn't that the one that's sucking all the energy out of the world? Or isn't that one a Ponzi scheme? Or isn't it blah, blah, blah? People are not ready for Bitcoin yet. But Bitcoin is the ultimate money. It's John Nash's, uh, the Nash equilibrium, you know, uh, the uh, simple mind wasn't it? What did he call? Uh, what well, they made a film about him, didn't they? And uh, he, he uh, defined an ideal money, and Bitcoin fits that ideal, but nobody's ready for it yet. So uh, you know that's why I'm in Bitcoin and not in the Swiss franc. Although I wouldn't be quite happy to be in the Swiss franc, but I was a bit disillusioned when they started printing it just to put the value of it down. You know they're diluting my holdings. You can't with Bitcoin. You nobody can dilute your holdings. They can't. There's 21 million of them. That's all there's going to be. And uh, you know, I won't go into the reasons why that's true, but take it from me. And uh, so I'm, my my holding in Bitcoin is not going to get diluted. So let's just recap. You've got the. Uh, a new government under what was, who's widely seen as an unelected leader because she's a prime minister. I mean, we do have a convention in this country that the we elect a party and then the party decides to elect its own leader. I um, um, uh, 
sorry, no, we, we yeah. Oh, how's the Prime Minister related? Yes. No, well, I mean, it depends from party to party, but in the Conservative Party, actually, that's not true. What happens is we elect a party, and then, then when I say the party elects the leader, what I mean is that the party membership elects the leader, right? Which is fair enough. Uh, you can't have the public voting on who they want to have as Prime Minister, because half the time people, they'd be trolling, wouldn't they, and saying they want the, the ugliest bloke or the uh, stupidest person or whatever, just for a laugh. That you, you get like uh, voting with both face syndrome. But um, but in, in the old GDPA, I think we did it the best way, which was that uh, the membership elected the council and then the council elected the uh, chairman. And so to be a uh, chairman, you had to have the faith and confidence of the 12 council members. And basically, they wouldn't elect anyone who's going to be a right idiot. You know, they elected someone that they would be prepared to follow. And I think the mistake that the Conservatives made was they had this uh, Prime Minister is... Um, open to... Prime Minister, sorry. The Prime Minister is um, elected by the membership, but then she has to lead the Parliamentary, uh, Parliamentary Conservative Party. And then in this case, you had a situation where one of them wanted one thing and the other one wanted another. And you get something very similar to Brexit, where the parliamentarians want one thing and the population wants another. Um, which really, in theory, shouldn't really happen, should it? I mean, the Parliament comes to this old... Uh, a uh, question about when you send someone to a conference, you know, do they have to vote how you would have voted? If you're a local dental committee and you send a representative to the annual conference of local dental committees, do they have to vote uh, in the way that you've mandated them to, or can they decide on the day that they've uh, heard a good argument to vote the other way and therefore they can vote the opposite? You know, are they, uh, are they, are they a delegate or are they a representative? I think I forget what the debate was anyway. But the point is that, you know, you can't, uh, they are accountable every five years to the public. So, I mean, you know, if they're acting like idiots, then presumably they get treated like idiots when it comes time to re-elect them. But trust, you know, not only did she have this uh, problem about uh, having the confidence of the uh, Conservative Party voters, but not really of the country or of the Parliamentary Conservative Party, um, and therefore, you know, it was very like a was a, a lame duck the minute she was elected. She's also got off on the worst possible foot by um, loosening the fiscal policy, government tax policy, by giving everybody tax cuts and then um, and increasing benefits. While at the same time, <laughs> in the very week, the Bank of England decides not to go along with the gag of buying government debt and, and decide that it's done enough and it's going to go, start selling it. And so she's like, oh, we're going to grow our way out of this debt. And the Bank of England said, oh, OK, right, we're going to, oh, OK, we're going to grow our way out of this debt. Are we? OK, fine. In that case, we'll start selling a few government bonds if it's all going to be OK. And she's like, <laughs> I don't think she even thought to, normally I would have, she was like, no, 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 guys, no, you've got, we're just saying we're going to grow our way out of this debt, you know, this is the game. We, we don't, we can't not pay the debt, uh, and we, we can't afford the debt. So we've got to either deflate it by, you know, by deflating it or uh, printing money and then just ruining the currency, or um, we can't grow our way out of it, you know, that was, I just said that, I just said that, okay, but then now we've got a Prime Minister, I think, actually does believe that she can grow her way out of it. I think she swallowed the Kool-Aid. <coughs> She's, she literally did think, and then and I think the Bank of England and the markets thought, Jesus Christ, this woman actually believes in her own rhetoric. She actually does think we can grow our way. She thinks we're Singapore. She thinks we're Hong Kong. She, so, she thinks we're going to put um, income tax down to 6% or nothing percent and abolish capital gains tax and and uh, abolish um, inheritance tax and abolish stamp duty and no wonder the markets had a fit so uh, 
So, you know, so expect the unexpected. That's what it all boils down to. And even if she goes, to, no one else is going to, you know, come in and be any better. So <coughs> it doesn't matter what emperor is in charge of Rome now. The, uh, the barbarians are at the gates. And very soon they'll be in the gates. And so just make sure, you know, make sure you've got a wood burner. Make sure you live in a house that's got, I don't know, at least an acre of ground so you can plow it out and plant vegetables if you need to. Work out where your source of uh, fresh water is. Buy a few, um, <clears throat> buy a few camping gas containers and some camping gas lights and a camping gas stove. Because it's all very well saying, there was a no, we don't, you know, if they're going to be rolling power cuts, we don't want you um, using uh, candles. We want you using torches, electric torches, because there's going to be no power. So we want you to use electric torches. <laughs> they, they don't, the irony of that is completely lost on the idiots, you know. Now, I'm not saying go and dig yourself a bunker. I'm just saying take reasonable precautions, you know, because these idiots, uh, the, the idiocy, I think now, is going to persist for a long time in the same way as they don't, you know, they want, they're, they're protesting that inflation's come out of 10% today, which is a significant figure because um, this is the figure that's going to be used to uprate everybody's pensions next year. And uh, the, the, nobody in their right mind believes that they're going to uprate pensions by 10%. So, because they, that's the whole part of the plan. The plan is to use inflation to depress people's working, working people's and anyone who's got any wealth, to de depress their purchasing power of their money, to lower their living standards. So if, if when they say, you know, you hear people on the say, oh, I don't know, we're passing all this debt on to the next generation. You're not passing it on to the next generation. You're paying for it now, right now. This is you paying for it right now, okay? In a, in a decrease in your living standard, what you can buy, places where you can go on holiday, you know, what you can, the car you drive. This is all getting downgraded to pay for Rishi Sunak and his pre predecessor sprinting. So, uh, and inflation is, is part of the plan. It's like that Die Hard movie, you know, where Hans Gruber says uh, the FBI's cut off the power? And he says, relax, he says, this is entirely expected. And he goes, and to a certain extent, necessary. And that's what inflation is at the moment. To people who are in the know, it's entirely expected. And as far as the government's concerned, to a certain extent, necessary to reset their debt. So they can start racking it up again. Okay, so now you're in the know. So don't tell anyone else or I'll have to come around and kill you. Anyway, nice talking to you. Bye.